constitutionalist, and our church knows that. He wrote in Joanna, or in Albania, American citizens, highly successful business people. And Hero's going to come and he's going to talk to us about free markets and the Bible. We have been blessed here in the United States to live under a free market system for over 230 years. We've been blessed with the freedom that we have. Not every nation, as a matter of fact, we're the only nation that has such codified freedoms and beliefs. And Hero's going to come and talk to us this morning about the subject that when ideas compete. And that's all I'm going to say. Piro, I want you to come. Time is yours. Listen to him carefully. Uh, our kids will stay in this morning. We're not going to the junior church, but our, our kids need to hear where you came from. Amen. And all here today. Piro, thank you, man. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. Thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you, Brother Jim, for the opportunity. We're going to look at a couple of things today that are. I think are very important to us, to our culture. Uh, the topic is somewhat controversial, almost like running this tablet. <laughs> there you go. Cool. This is not really a topic that comes to mind when you go to church on Sunday morning, right? Yeah. You know, we usually talk about economics. Um, the Bible talks just about everything. Talks about science, talks about medicine, talks about social behavior. And it does speak about economics too. As a matter of fact, God is very much interested in uh, how the world runs economically. Much of uh, the law that he gave to his people, the Jews, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, and Deuteronomy, has to do with social behavior and how. People relate to one another economically. Uh, there is a specific section dedicated to property lines in Scripture. It, it's one of those that your eyes glaze over when you start reading it. But it, there, there's, a, there's a whole dedicated section on where property lines should be and what happens if you move them by mistake or if you move them intentionally and what the penalties are. And there's a whole section on uh, tort law. What happens if you hurt somebody's cow or ox, and what happens if somebody's ox hurts you, and if it's intentional or not intentional? There's all kinds of rules and regulations, and we often look at that and say, well, those are just rules and regulations. No, that's just how to, uh, to help us relate to one another. So I'm, I'm very, well, first of all, shocked that in the 21st century we have to talk against socialism. Yeah, I thought that that was done back in the 90s, apparently not. It is the most competing idea of our time. Uh, it is the, uh, the, the most prevalent ideology of our time. The idea of centralized markets, of government-run everything. And while I am not necessarily uh, an economic guru or a uh, guru for capitalism, I have lived under socialism, and I also have studied the scripture, and I've also lived under free market capitalism, and I think that freedom is always better than the opposite of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the scripture teaches just that. So we're going to look at a couple of things. Uh, we vaguely describe this as capitalism when ideas compete. But other working titles are, only free markets are fair, everything else is sanctioned theft. Mm. <laughs> That's something to think about. Another working title, give you something to think about, Jesus is not a socialist. Mm. You hear a lot about that, Jesus was a socialist, they had everything in common, that means that the first church was communistic, far from it. If you study the scriptures, if you look at the story, how it develops, eventually by the end of the New Testament, Paul says, he that does not work does not eat. Amen. Yep. And if you cannot take care of your own family, you are worse than an infidel. There is never in scripture any ascribing of authority to human government to take care of individual needs. It is always personal responsibility. These concepts are important. 
Um, hang on. So the story that I'm going to tell you is a very personal story. Um, both my wife and I were born and raised in the country of Albania. If you don't know what it is, it's okay. Nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Southeastern Europe, uh, between Greece and Italy, on the Adriatic coast. She was born in the northernmost part. I was born in the southernmost part. And uh, we lived under a very strict socialist rule. The government ran everything. We lived in one of the most isolated countries of the world. We had no contact with the outside world. We only knew the version of history that the government had sanctioned. We only knew about the version of economics that the government had sanctioned. We had no idea how free markets work. I didn't even know what it was. And we were constantly under threat of conquest from the imperialist West. Unfortunately, it never happened. <laughs> we were hoping and praying that it never, never happened. Uh, growing up, I witnessed, we both witnessed firsthand the fall, the, the fall and the chaos that socialism left behind. Uh, we were witnesses to uh, when the, after the Berlin Wall had fallen and how Eastern Europe opened up to the West and socialist governments just crumbled. Uh, we were witnesses to that. We knew that. We, we lived through that. And it wasn't just something that we read about in history books. For us, we grew up, we came up in that. During our formative years, uh, much of them were spent in bread lines. And that's, that's an actual photo of uh, people competing, that's the only competition that was allowed, for bread in, in Albania. That was late, not, late 80s. And you had, if you lived in a certain part of town, you had a certain place where you were designated to go shopping for bread, and that's where you would go, and there was a limited supply. Y'all's bread came sliced, right? <laughs> Free sliced and packaged. That was, that was a grocery store, and there was no line. It was just first come, first serve, or first push, first serve. Uh, that, was, that was life. That was every day. That was the normal, actually. Nobody complained about it because that was the norm. It was taken for granted that you would have to go there and stand in line for two or three hours until the truck with the bread came and there was a possibility that he would run out before it was your turn to go to the counter and hand the bills over to the salespeople and they would hand it to you. And then what you did, well, you got a beating when you got home if you didn't bring bread. You know? it, was, it, it, it was that bad. My story changed, though. It wasn't always that. Uh, at the age of 14, I was saved. I became a Christian. Albania opened up in the 90s and uh, foreign Western influence came in along with Western missionaries. And for the first time I heard the gospel, a completely different paradigm than what I had been taught and heard throughout my entire life growing up. There is a God, and here are people that not only believe it, but live that. Here are the proof that there is a God. And God loves me and He died for me, for my sins, and He's coming back for me. Amen. And that's, that was revolutionary. That was the spiritual revolution that took place. And I lived that. I heard the gospel, it, it appropriated to me. For the first time, I realized that there was really this person named Jesus. He actually lived. He was an historical figure. It wasn't just a, a, a fable or a story that would tell. It wasn't just a religious myth. I heard that he died on the cross for my sins instead of me, and he rose again the third day. I believed that I became a Christian. My life changed ever since then. At the age of 18, I came to the United States to attend Bible college. That's where I met Jim. Um, 
I surrendered to the ministry, and I, I went to Bible college to preach. And then during my formative years, past 18, I made a significant discovery. I realized that free markets are better than centrally planned markets. There was always this question, why is the West better off than us? And that was a real question where I come from. Why is the West better off than us? And there were many answers to that. Well, one of the answers was because they ripped us off. Mm. That's what the government said. These Western imperialists have ripped us off and they have stolen our, place, our rightful place in the world and they have taken up resources and they're fighting this hidden warfare against us and we must be prepared for invasion at any time. <laughs> you know, still don't know what I'm <laughs> That's the same propaganda that uh, they hear in North Korea today. Mm -hmm. That's the same stuff. Those people there, they're hearing in government radios and televisions that the imperialist West is fighting warfare against us. They want to conquer us. They want to enslave us. So we better double up on slave labor in these mines to produce more coal. That's what they're hearing. Mm. That's what we heard. One of the answers was because the West has been, uh, has more riches, more natural resources. Um, we found out that wasn't true. There's plenty of natural resources in the East. Mm. Plenty of water and plenty of minerals and plenty of soil to plant stuff. Uh, plenty of crops to pick from. Just nobody cared for them. It's interesting. Nobody, nobody cared for the crops. Nobody cared for the orchards. Nobody cared about the citrus groves. Nobody cared about, we have citrus where I come from, by the way. Nobody cared about the uh, grapevines. It wasn't theirs. It was all the government's. What do I get if I care about this? Nothing will change in my life. I will still have to go there at the end of the day. No matter how hard I work, I will still have to be in that line that you see. I will still have to compete for a loaf of bread. Mm. No incentive. Why is the West better off? Well, I realized, as many others realized, that freedom always works. Mm -hmm. Freedom is always better off than not freedom. Mm. And when people are free to develop, when people are free to invent, when people are free to buy, sell, and trade, life gets better. Life always gets better. We have air conditioning in the church here today. And how did this come about? Well, the government didn't put this in. <laughs> the government did not invent this. Mr. Carrier did. <laughs> And, and it was his initiative that said, hey, it's hot in here. <laughs> I bet you I can find a way to make the air cooler without everybody having to uh, run around the building to create a vortex. And he did. <laughs> and the world is better off because of that, especially Florida. <laughs> Some of you all lost power a few weeks ago. But what was the first thing you missed? Air AC. <laughs> right? We didn't lose power, thank God. Uh, we, didn't, we had a few fallen limbs. We were persecuted that way. <laughs> but, uh, that was our worst fear. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do with that AC? <laughs> and I told Joanna, hey, we can just relive our younger years. <laughs> we can just pretend we're back. Yeah? And so that's, that's how it is. Uh, a significant discovery. Free markets are better than uh, not free markets. But in today's society, we hear this amazing contradiction that somehow socialism is better off. That uh, somehow a centrally planned life from a central body, a government, uh, will somehow result in life being better for everyone. And you hear things like, we need to have uh, free health care. 
You know, it should be free for everyone. That is the debate of the day. That is the controversy of the day. Mm -hmm. We hear things like education should be free. Higher education should be free. Nobody should have to go through life with student loans. Um, housing should be free. We hear a lot about that. We hear uh, a lot of stuff about um, fair pay or a livable wage. Uh, everybody wants to get paid in such a way that uh, they can afford whatever they want to afford. And of course the government should make sure that that happens. We hear a lot today in the West about women's emancipation, women's rights, and fairness. Well, we also hear about gender as a social construct, so I don't understand that. How can it be a social construct and then there's women's rights? One or the other, you can't have both. You know? There's a lot about abortion on demand. Mm. And freedom from religion. We need to stop the oppressive religious ways of the Judeo Christianic culture that has oppressed us for so long. Wow. That's what you hear today if you pick up any publication in, in the mainstream media that these are the issues. This is, this is the fight of our generation. I got news for you. Mm. I grew up hearing this stuff. It was the same issues. The same issues. We had free health care. We did. It was free. You could go to any hospital, any emergency room, and it was free. Mm. Um, it looked like a field hospital during the Civil War. <laughs> There, there, there were no private rooms, mm -hmm. there were no CT scans, there was no advanced technology to diagnose or treat. It was just making you comfortable. You could die from tonsillitis or cancer. It just, you know, <laughs> depends. Infant mortality rates, sky high. People died from the simplest things. Treatable disease that in the West had not been seen for decades is very common. Free education, yeah, we had free education. You could go to get a four year uh, college degree for free, it didn't cost you a dime. But the government